live from Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee, His Vine Free Seventh-day Adventist Church welcomes you to Sabbath service. Here at His Vine, we believe the Bible is the infallible Word of God, which authenticates the original Advent message given by God to the pioneers of Adventism, confirmed by and united with God's prophet, Ellen G. White. Gather with us around God's throne as we worship in prayer, praise, and song. Service includes inspired messages, children's stories, and a health awareness segment. In this time of crisis where proper nutrition and the building up of our immune systems are key, receive health tips from accredited nutritionist Glennis Dodds Mills. Our sermon featuring God's present truth series, The Three Angels Message with Pastor Charles D. Mills. Our topic this week, Message of the Second Angel. Blessed Sabbath to everyone who has joined us today for worship and those of us here in the sanctuary today. Again, it's another blessed day that God has given us and we should be very thankful and praise him as he has asked us to meet with him today. So let's be very thankful to God as we worship. Um, before we um, tune our voices and singing, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another Sabbath day that you have given us. We thank you for your blessings of the past days of the week. And Lord, you have asked us to leave all of our cares and all of the struggles behind and rest in you today. And we thank you that you have given us this time. I pray that you will be with us, dear Father, as we worship today. We invite your Holy Spirit in our presence to be with us now and always. We cannot do anything that is right and pleasing to you without your Holy Spirit guiding and directing us. Lord, forgive us where we have misrepresented you in the past days of the week. Show us, dear Father, even now where we need to confess before you that you can hear our prayers today and that you can truly tabernacle with us. May your name be glorified in everything that is said and done. I pray, Lord, that you will take care of every piece of equipment that is used for broadcasting, that those who are listening online can hear everything clearly, and that your name can be glorified in them also. We thank you and give you honor and glory, and we ask for every mercy in the holy name of Jesus with thanksgiving. Amen. Again, I want to say welcome to everyone who has um, joined us today on the um, various platforms for worship. May God bless each one as we worship. Our first hymn today, Safely Through Another Week, God has brought us on our way, and we can be thankful in saying that truly, safely through, God has brought us. <laughs> Today, 
At this time, we have our opening theme song as we sing Thy Truth to the music of My Jesus. I love thee. And um, today, we do not have a um, health segment um, by God's grace. We will have one next Sabbath by the grace of God. Um, thy Truth to the music of My Jesus. I love thee. joined us for our service today. Our next hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Number 76 in the new hymnal. And those of you who may be using the old, it's number 145 in the old. 145 in the old and 76 in the new. O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Thank you. 
Look at this time we do a song of worship. Um, my maker and my king, number 15 in the new, and in the old is number 71. 71 in the old, 15 in the new, my maker and my king.
Blessed Sabbath to everyone. God is good. He is taking care of us. He's brought us into his house on this his holy Sabbath. We need to give him more thanks than ever before. As a few little notes of importance, there are those who have only been able to get us through Periscope and just keep us in prayer. We are needing help in the technology departments of our church. And we're just asking the Lord to press upon the heart of someone to join and be a partner with us in doing the work that God has given us to do. Today, our children's story is about Billy. Billy, he, he had his agenda all set up. As he was sneaking out or just going very quietly out the back door, he heard his mother say, Billy, I need you. That is not the sound that Billy was looking for. Billy wanted to do something for himself. He wanted to enjoy an afternoon with his buddies, and yet mom called. And so he turned around and he went to see what mom was so needing to him for. And mother said, Billy, I need to go to the hairdresser, go to the grocery store. I need to take care of some things, and I really can't take your baby sister with me. She shouldn't be too much troubles, but you need to be here at the house to take care of her and watch over her. Oh, Mom, really? I really do it. Okay, I'll do it. Billy was a little frustrated, but he decided, well, I'm going to lose out this afternoon and the fun, but at least I'm doing what I'm told. And so he saw mother out the door and time for baby sister to have a nap. And so he took care of his baby sister and laid her down in a crib. And as soon as he laid her down, baby sister was doing nothing but crying, was not happy. There was nothing that would pacify her. The stuffed animals arranged just so all of the little things in her crib wasn't going to make her a bit happier. She didn't even want to pacify her. She was very upset. And so Billy decided, okay, I'll pick you up. And once he picked her up, she started settling down. And so Billy decided, well, I guess I'll take and sit down in the rocking chair here in the living room and just kind of Snug, let her snuggle up to me a little bit. And, well, this isn't too bad. And as babies do, and they get comfortable immediately, his sister was fast asleep. And Billy thought, well, this isn't too bad a thing, even though I'm missing out on what I really wanted to do. I really love my baby sister. And then as the time passed by, Billy fell asleep too. But something woke him up and with a start, he jumped and baby sister was wide awake then. And just about that same time, mom walked in. Well, what a pretty sight you two are, she said. Has baby sister had any real problem? No, just, we've been doing just fine. I'm a little disappointed I wasn't able to be with the guys this today, but it's been a whole week since we were got together and went to the swimming hole, but we had a good time, baby sister and I. Brothers and sisters, 
children, we need to do what's right all the time. And when we are asked to do something, if we do it happily, no matter what we wanted to do, God will bless us. And he will give us the joy of our hearts. And that is the most important thing, that we can glorify God in all the things that we do. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, we remember our church member whose mother passed away, and we just, again, ask that the Holy Spirit will condone and condole and console the hearts of the family that have lost the loved one. There are many that die, more and more. And we just need to say, Lord, protect your people. Amen. Empower us that we may serve thee no matter what. Amen. Let us kneel sing our song as we come to you in prayer and kneel before his throne. this, your holy Sabbath, we come into your house and we, we thank you that you have invited us and that you long to tabernacle with us. We come as we are, as you've told us to, and we recognize ourselves as sinners. We ask thee, Lord, to cleanse us from any unrighteousness by the power of the blood of your Son. Give us of your Holy Spirit and teach us. But Lord, we have these burdens that we need to give to you. The burdens of our hearts, emotional burdens, mental anguishes, and physical needs. Each one we leave with you. Help us, Father, to understand how to take care of our physical bodies even better than before. We can cooperate with you and be a lighthouse of health and strength where the world is languishing in sickness and death. Lord, in each aspect, we desire that your name be glorified in our lives. And so give us strength to be obedient in all things, to trust you in all things. And Lord, we just Lift up your servants, ministers, and pastors in, in Africa right now. Strengthen them. For though we desire to be a help to them, and we are not able, we know that you can provide where we can. We know that your strength is greater than anything man has. Amen. Your power and your goodness. So in each case, Lord, may your name be glorified as they serve you where they are, as we desire to serve where we are. And we give you thanks. So tabernacle and be with us. This your holy Sabbath, in Jesus' name.
Let us stand as we read our scripture reading for today. One verse with a lot of meaning. Matthew 15, verse 9. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You may be seated. Our special song today is I Found a Friend. Oh, such a friend. In the old hymnal, 531, 531 in the old, 186 in the new.
merciful Father in heaven today, this seventh day of the week, the day that you have set apart, sanctified and made holy, the day that you rested from all creation, the day that the, you, the Son of God, rested in the grave, and redeeming, paying the price for sin on Calvary. Lord, the holy seventh day of the week, this time you have called for a convocation to come into your house. And your people have come. We need of your Holy Spirit to teach us. And you have designed through the foolishness of preaching that your word be brought. For the world thinks it foolish, but we know it has power from your throne. And so, Lord, now help us and strengthen us. Magnify thyself and tabernacle with us that when we leave this place, we will be light to those around us in everything. We will be able to use your word and articulate to others because we have grounded into our own lives. May these things glorify thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Drunk with Babylonian wine. Today here, as we continue in the second angel's message, there will be no new theological revelation. For there is none that is given. There is only God's declaration of a fact of reality. Revelation 14, 8. And there and followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon fallen. We spoke of it last Sabbath. We understood it not to be of pagan Rome, for it has always been in a fallen condition. Here the second angel is declaring that Babylon is fallen. It has fallen from a pure state at one time. And it has made the world drink of its wine. How is this wine which God speaks of made? We learned it is this mixing of the philosophy of the world with the truth of God and presenting it as the gospel. And every church who is professing to be Christian, who brings this amalgamated transformated wine, this fermented wine of God's word with the philosophy of the world, when it is brought to the people, it will make them drunk on man's ideas, man's thoughts, and not rejuvenated and brought life purified from sin as the gospel of God will do, but corrupts the mind even deeper into sin. God has wants every individual who professes to be God's people to keep their faith pure 
and not allow the philosophies of the world to corrupt its belief and doctrinal faith. The wisdom of God is pure, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good, which fruit of God's Holy Spirit is produced. But when the philosophy of the world is allowed life in the church, this philosophy brings nothing but death, eternal death. Remember this and never forget it. Assimilation is a law of human nature. You can't get away from it. You are a human being. This law has three components. First, it begins with association. When we associate with worldly principles in our life, we will have to make a choice. We will either have to remain in association or disassociate ourselves with it. And if we remain in association, then we will make accommodation for those principles. And when we provide accommodation, we will experience assimilation. If we associate ourselves with the, those that have the philosophy of this world, we will become drunk in that philosophy if we make accommodation for their friendship. Pure godly wisdom will be removed. For we cannot reject God's design path of wisdom and still have godly wisdom. And when any church by force makes this wine to be drunk by those of its members, it is fallen and in drunken apostasy. It is in an adulterous relationship for that church or that individual which has professed to be a Christian but is openly united with the world, that professed Christianity is corrupted and will increase in that corruption without the purifying, pure word of God. Unless there's repentance and true reformation, the downward path will be nothing but eternal destruction. Remember, there is many roots of Babylon. It comes from seed sown in rebellion against God and his truth at the Tower of Babel. The result was utter confusion when God punished their corruptive ways by confounding the language of humanity. And from that confounding came culture and ethnic traditions. Nothing of God, but only in rebellion. All are designed to glorify self and their ethnicity. This intoxicating wine has many recipes. And yet there's only one solution. We must be washed clean from all sin and its nature. We must take hold of God's word daily, his power from his throne, trusting implicitly in the words that he has given, the pure and holy. And as we now proceed, 
let us closely examine the wine that has been offered. Wine in the intoxicating form is fermented grape juice. The Bible also talks about pure wine, the unfermented grape juice, that grape juice that God has ordained properties to be in, to purify the blood of the human body, to give it strength and vitality. But when sugar and fermentation is added, the grape juice becomes intoxicating and destructive to the human brain. That wine given by Babylon causes the individual, the organization, to stagger in its Christian walk and profession of faith. It becomes unstable mentally and spiritually. I love what John Loughborough wrote in The Last Day Tokens, page 162. The wine of Babylon, as explained by Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, he's, he's giving us the definition that we have established as the wine of Babylon. The doctrines by which the church was blinding the eyes of the people as to the great truths connected with the judgment hour message. The truth connected with God's judgment. That's the first angel's message. And because the first angel's message was rejected, there were doctrines that were amalgamated in paganism that was used to blind the people to God's truth. What false doctrines? Blinding the people from the truth that God wanted to reveal. What is the wine of these fallen systems of professed Christianity that have for men to drink? Doctrines of men. Jesus declares as our scripture reading, in vain they do what? Worship me. Worship God. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They profess to be ministers and pastors of Christ of God's gospel. But instead of giving God's true gospel, they give the teachings of men instead of the teachings of God. We must understand God's people will never become sealed in righteousness drinking of that wine. It doesn't matter what denomination they have behind their title. When pastors who corrupt Bible truths with worldly sinful thoughts and ideas, you will not be sealed in righteousness listening to those ministers. Therefore, let us take a look at some of these false doctrines only two today. But we are going to dig deep in one. And not deep enough, I'm afraid. First one was the lie first declared by Satan. For in Genesis 3, 4, the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God hath, doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall what? Yes. Be as gods, 
knowing both good and evil. Did Satan teach any truth there? Oh, yes, he did. The problem is he didn't leave the whole truth. He just used partly. The effect of knowing both good and evil was a reality, but when knowing evil, you were going to have a nature change to desiring only evil. And I'm sure that if Adam and Eve had known the evil consequences of their decision, I'm sure that they would have had second thoughts. The patriarchs and prophets, there's a beautiful segment on Adam. It's not by happenstance that great controversy ends with also another prophetic prophecy of what's going to happen with Adam again. For Adam, his 900 plus years saw the degradation of humanity. And in great controversy, he sees that cost of his sin in the death of his close personal friend, the Son of God. As they meet there, overwhelmed with grief, Christ assures them it's okay. The doctrine of the first ingredient of the wine of Babylon is the doctrine of the natural immortality of the soul. We have in the past dealt with this doctrine of man's devising inspired by Satan which was founded in pagan mythology. This doctrine was introduced to bring into the church pagans, to make them feel more comfortable in Christianity. This doctrine destroys and makes the last enemy of man death into a gate of eternal joy. The very fact that God's judgment, the need of a resurrection, and the power of death caused by sin, all of these things are skewed and destroyed with this doctor. It is the very foundation of every type of spiritualism, which is now affected the very concept of man's thinking process. Even in the most conservative spiritual thinking, the corruption of spiritualism is there. You see, God says very clearly through the inspiring of Paul, God only hath immortality. Let us understand it. If man had immortality, then the gospel would not be needed. Sure. God only offers eternal life as a gift to those who will accept the gift. Amen. For Romans 6.23, the gift of God is life, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need the gift. Amen. Why do we need the gift if we already have immortality? Exactly. Are we trying to make God a liar? A frog? 
for Solomon, the wisest man, under inspiration, made it very clear. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Now we need to stop right here for a minute. The memory of the dead is forgotten. My grandmother, my mother, my grandfather, they have no more knowledge of me. I have of them, why? Because I'm alive, by God's grace. But of their memory, they have none. Verse 6, also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Nothing of their characterability is alive. Amen. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything done under the sun. Like it has always been told, if the dead knew what was going on in this world, it would be total misery to those who they, that they love. Sure. To view, to understand what is going on and have no ability to influence for better life is miserable and hard to deal with. Even more, if you were in heaven enjoying the glories of heaven and you saw your son, your daughter, or your grandson, your great-grandson in the mire of sin, heaven would not be a joyful place. That's right. And so God allows our love, our hatred, our envy, everything to perish when we die. Let us trust God's holy word, the pure and the simple. This inspired word declares that those who die have nothing more to do under the sun, and let's keep it that way. But let us also demand, how about two witnesses? So Job makes it clear, Job 7, verse 9, as the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall what? Come up no more. He shall return no more to his house. Neither shall his place know him anymore. Therefore, we need to make it very clear. If your spouse, your uncle, your aunt, passes away and shockingly the person appears in your home no it is not him or her but a demon of hell impersonating that of which you love denounce it in the name of Jesus and he will flee from you amen for demons cannot stay in the same place where Jesus is. If you still think something odd, then maybe what this preacher is saying isn't true. Let us consider what Jesus himself said about the dead. John 11, 11. 
Our friend Lazarus what? Sleepeth. Sleepeth. But I go that he may, that I may awake him out of sleep. Verse 12, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spoke of his what? Death. Death. But they thought he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Verse 14, then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So if we go back to verse 11, we can say very clearly, our friend Lazarus is dead. Yes. Amen. But I go that I may awake him out of death into life. Yet the majority will still prefer to believe the lies of Satan. The lie told first in the Garden of Eden and has brought to men now to the very 6,000 and plus years. The grievousness of its effects. For it makes God worse than Hitler. Hitler massacred millions. Pol Pot massacred millions. The Tsar of Russia massacred millions. But God is seen as worse than law. with this doctor of ever burning in hell. The wicked burning forever and ever and ever, never to be consumed is the human thinking and the distortion and the lies of Satan. And yet ministers who know the truth will never give it up because that they believe is their hold on the people. Instead of the love of God. If we cannot see God's love, why do we really want to serve? A God who cannot love. You see, it's God's love we see even in the punishment of the wicked. Notice in God's love letter to his people, he affirms the truth about death. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the what? First resurrection on such what? Second. The second death hath no power. Here God is showing us that there is a first death which is sleeping, but this second death, that's something different. We must understand the difference between first death and second death. Verses 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of what? Fire. This is the second death. Now, how can death be put into fire and it be now the second death? 
Let us continue with verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in what? The book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire. Where evil and all sin is consumed. And it is verified through chapter 21 verse 8. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And the verse ends very clearly. This is the second death. God is love. And yet his justice must be satisfied. God's only son paid the price for sin. The death of the wicked. The death of the wicked, which is not the cross, but is an instrument of death. The death of the wicked is not the lake of fire. That's the instrument of death. The death for which the wicked must pay is a death never to be raised up again. The death of extinction. For Jesus died that death for every repentant, forgiven, every unrepentant, every unforgiven sinner will experience that death. A death of total separation from God. You see, even those that do not acknowledge God's existence still has in them the power of God to even live. For we of ourselves cannot live without the power pack of the nucleus of the cell, which scientists today knows it, they cannot duplicate it. It is the power of God in us. And when God shuts off that nuclear power pack in our cells, we die. Total separation. Name one nine. That death. What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Affliction meaning sin. The Hebrew meaning trouble or rival. Satan, the originator of sin, rebellion, set himself as a rival against God. And God says, no more. There come a time when the very root of abominable rival against God, sin, will be completely rooted out of the universe and it will be entirely universally in harmony. Yeah. Not by force, but by choice. Choosing life and God's government above everything of this world of sin. And throughout eternity, future 
there will be only the sign that the payment of sin is death. For only in the hands, the side, and feet of Jesus our Savior will the prince of the nails and the sword be seen. The only sign that ever sin has ever existed will be in the Son of God. For our Savior bore our sin in death. He made himself sin for us who knew no sin. Pure, spotless life lived for us, died for us. And when we see God's love, and when we experience his love, we will desire to worship him also as he has designed us to worship. So now we turn to the next deadly air in this wine of Babel. It is concerning worship for the changing of the Sabbath from the first day of the week to the from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week is the mark of Roman Catholicism and paganism brought into Christianity. For thousands of years, pagans worshiped the sun. And Roman Catholicism said, hey, we need to have a wider influence. Let's adopt this and bring the pagan in with us. Beginning in 320, 313 A.D. with the Adic and, and 323, with the death decree in 538 A.D., Roman Catholicism in grained in the human mind that worshiping God on the first day was now God's will. Catholic record in 1923 makes it clear. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. They literally tell you because you are obeying us and we believe we're above God's word yeah, right. <clears throat> and you worshiping on the day we said was holy makes you ours. Notice what the Scottish theologian said. Sunday was a name given by the heathen to the first day of the week because it was the day which they worshiped the sun. The seventh day was blessed and hallowed by God himself, and he requires his creatures to keep it holy to him. Amen. This commandment is of what? Universal. Universal and perpetual obligation. Amen. Now let us understand something. The title of the sermon, Drunk with Babylonian Wine, The question is, could it be possible that we worshiping on the seventh day of the week are drunk with the Babylonian wine, professing to keep the Sabbath holy? You 
You see, Edie's biblical cyclopedia made the statement, God requires his creatures to keep it holy to him. The question is, are we keeping it holy to him? Or are we drunk with just enough wine to do our own thing on God's holy day? You see, every major professed Christian religion has confessed that the holy Sabbath of God is the seventh day of the week, which the pagan world has identified as Saturday, but God has sanctified it as his holy Sabbath. These first two <coughs> excuse me, ingredients of what God has identified as doctrines that place the church into a fallen, rejected state. Why? Because these both are directly lifeblood of pagan worship, authored first by Satan in the Garden of Eden. Yes, even Sunday worship has its root and deception accepted there at the garden, which we will understand soon. Concerning God's holy Sabbath, we must consider that the vast majority today professing to keep the Sabbath holy, profane it weekly, and even daily in their lives. You see, by calling God's holy Sabbath a pagan name, we are demeaning its holiness. When we are not looking forward, when we're not planning our appointments with God on this, his holy Sabbath day, using the first six days of the week appropriately, will bring us unprepared to receive the real spiritual nourishment God desires to bless us with. We should mark this day with care and reverence. Not just the hours of the Sabbath, but in everything we do during the week, it should be done with the preparation for God's holy day in our minds. We should be inviting others to experience that which we desire to experience. These are very important aspects of keeping the Sabbath holy. Review and Herald, April 15, 1890, the prophet of God wrote these words. God made his law for all the universe. He created man and gives the bounteous provisions of nature. Holds our breath and life in what? His hand. His hand. He is to be recognized, his law honored before all the great men and of the highest earthly powers. In every way possible, being respectful to all our conversation should be one that reveals the love of God and his character in his law. Every commandment is a reflection of God's character. Our lives must be empowering, but must be lived by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. A mere image of that same character of love. The Sabbath has been so lightly regarded that no longer sins of stomping our feet on God's holy day is either thought or considered as sin. We just do it because everybody else does it. I know one self-supporting pastor in California that literally lost an entire church. They literally abandoned him 
because he got up in the pulpit and talked on this subject of keeping the Sabbath holy. And he said, we've got to stop going to restaurants on Sabbath. In California, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, they do not have their meals at home. They literally go to the restaurant right after church. They take so little of God's design for their lives that they don't even take God's preparation day for his Holy Sabbath seriously. And I will tell you right now, when you do not take the preparation day as God has given it to you, you will never enter into his rest. That's right. The Sabbath has been so lightly regarded that no longer is sins when we stomp our feet on his holy day. As people, we are heading straight into denying that we were like Seventh-day Adventists. We're not Seventh-day Adventists. We, we're First-day Adventists now. When we lightly regard the Holy Sabbath and the pressure of when you worship comes to a head, you will agree with the pagan-inspired words of one well-known professed Seventh-day Adventist, it doesn't matter which day you worship as long as you worship on a day. That man ran for president, even though he claimed to be an Adventist. You cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist and run for politics. Amen. God says you are not, no matter what you think. We are to stay out of politics. We are to stay out of voting. We are to lean on the power of God and know the time of our visitation. Amen. Instead of God's people lowering the standards, we must fight to raise them higher and higher and higher as we look for his soon coming. We will soon stand in rebuke when God's viewpoint of our lives comes to, point, comes to view. Our murmuring and complaining is just like the days of the Jews of old. Loving the world's view is never seeking God's view. It is when we are exalting the seventh-day Sabbath that we distinguish ourselves separate from the world. Every day our minds should be on the blessings in store as we look forward to entering into his house on his holy day. Preparation needs to be made and made timely. And then with our words and actions, people will see a marked difference between us and the rest of those around us. And it will be for God's glory and honor, not your own. But sadly, far too many Seventh-day Adventists drag themselves out of bed, maybe to get to midday service. There's a reality here. The most important time of worship in God's house is not the preaching service. Never forget this. A God-ordained, God-sanctified Sabbath school is more important than the preaching service. But far too often, we lay in bed and maybe get to church for the 11 o'clock hour. We need to understand 
It is when we come to Sabbath school, and like I said, a well-ordered Sabbath school, and we learn and discuss and study his word together will be much more accomplished than listening to a hundred DVDs. But we lazily have become lazy Adventists and spend our time listening to this preacher, listening to this preacher, listening to this one, and we have no idea what we all know. Now this church here, we've been studying Romans now for almost a year or more. And we're uh, in Romans 12. If there's anyone who wants to join us for Sabbath school, send me an email. It's being posted up on the screen right now. We need to learn what God has given to us thoroughly. And we sometimes only go through two or three questions in the Sabbath school, but we learn. It's ready. We're averaging three to four weeks per lesson. We finished Romans 12, 1 through 8. Took us three weeks on eight verses. And be frank, we could have probably spent 12 more weeks if I would have deviated from the lesson just a little bit. But that's not God's order. We need to understand how to keep God's holy Sabbath, holy. It's not going to a church service, eating a big meal, and sleeping the rest of the afternoon off. And then as soon as the sun hits, down on the horizon, and we see it dark outside, we're up for the all-nighter. We're going to have some good old-fashioned Christian service, this fellowship now. We're going to spend the entire night playing dominoes. God forbid Amen. that any of his people think this is keeping the Sabbath holy. Wagner puts it this way. The Sabbath is not for the purpose of resting the body. Amen. Just think about that. The night is given for rest. And nobody has any business to get so weary in his daily toil that he cannot get rested over the night so as to be fresh in the morning. The night is given for physical rest, the Sabbath for spiritual refreshment. Amen. If man needed no other rest than the rest of the body, there would be what? No need for the, no Sabbath. Need for the Sabbath. This is why there's a lot of people who believe in once saved, always saved, that work seven days a week. And they don't even go to church on Sunday because they believe that because they've already been saved, they don't have to do anything on this world to keep anything holy, to even have God in their mind because they're already saved. The devil has people so screwed up in their minds that the spirituality, the spiritual health of our minds are completely rejected. Wagner continues. He says, whoever comes up to the Sabbath so jaded in the body 
that he is obligated to devote all or a portion of it, night except, of course, accepted, to sleep and physical recreation is not a Sabbath keeper of it, but what? A Sabbath breaker. What is he saying, physical recreation? Is he promoting playing games on Sabbath? No. No, the spiritual physical recreation includes going for walks. Amen. Walking in nature. Going out in nature on Sabbath. is fine to do but if it is all you do and you're not coming into his house for worship first and you're spending your whole day either in bed or in nature you are a sabbath breaker not a sabbath keeper because we are called into a holy convocation into his house. Amen. Praise the Lord, we have technology where people can devote an area of their home to be able to view the service online. But we need to be spending the Sabbath not only listening to a sermon, but studying the Word of God. Amen. Let us also clearly understand that the Sabbath is God's holy day, not ours to do as we please Amen. or what we prefer to do. It is not a time when God allows for seclusion even for the studying of our Bibles. For Hebrews 10, 23 onward says these, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without what? Amen. Wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. This problem was going in Paul's day. But exhorting one another and so much more as we see what? The day approaching. The day approaching. What day is Paul talking about? The second coming of Christ. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling together. Here, importantly, let us consider how we assemble. This is important. We need to be very careful in how we assemble. I'm strongly convicted on this subject. You're going to have to come with a whole lot of proof quotes to get me off of it then I probably still won't. Every one of us should assemble before the throne of God on his holy day. We should expect while in attendance in God's house here on earth be it in reality, physically in the building, or through technology, every child of God should demand that their minds be stimulated in contemplation throughout the remainder of the Sabbath and into the new week by those things of fresh bread of heaven that has been presented at the altar of God. Every Sabbath, our hearts should be stirred anew. Amen. 
we must be sure of the new wine from heaven is what we are drinking and not drinking of Satan's designs. Amen. There are falsehoods widespread being taught as truth, even in Adventism. These lies are fabricated by Satan himself to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And we must make our calling and election sure. We must never tread our feet on the Sabbath. Amen. We're doing it. And many do it ignorantly. And we need to confess and make a reformation in our lives. How are we treading on God's holy day? Let's take a look at Isaiah 58. Heavenly Father, before we look at this word that you inspired, help us right now, every individual, to come to your word seeking your viewpoint. That nothing of man will be in this, but it'll be only yours. Give us the power and strength to confess where we're wrong. Give us the desire to change. And by your spirit, transform our characters that we may surely be empowered by your throne to keep your holy Sabbath holy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Isaiah 58, 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine Thy own, own words. words. Six main points of behavior, and there's more. We could go into more, but we're going to identify six actions of behavior. The first two, turn your foot from God's holy day. Turn yourself from doing your own pleasure. Call the Sabbath a delight. Not doing our own ways. Not finding our own pleasure. And lastly, not speaking our own words. Six things. But if we ask ourselves this question, are we drunk with this world? Six aspects that we need complete understanding in our minds and what we live in our lives by God's viewpoint. Are we drunk with the world professing to be Seventh-day Adventists? Are we so drunk we don't even realize our own personal condition? Let us mark God's Sabbath with the importance and distinction it deserves. As God has designed it to be the Sabbath honorable, a joy, a delight, 
of heavenly proportion. Are we guilty every Sabbath before God? For we are guilty when we fail to keep our minds fully locked in God's presence and for his pleasure. In today's society, Satan has deceived the majority. Intense pleasure and traditional behavior that is found few. We practice this admonition that has been given to God from God. We're going to take a look at three points of the six. But I encourage you to meditate on every aspect of this verse. Turn thy foot from the Sabbath. Weekly, men and women tread their feet on God's holy day in their minds. For a while in church, they're still thinking about the week past and the business transactions that they made or the things that they're planning to do in the future. They're not listening to God in his house. They're sleeping the afternoon away while they wait with anticipation to open up their business at sundown. Or go to some Christian, quote, Christian fellowship for the night of pleasure. Treading on God's holy day is far easier with our words and actions than the vast majority will even understand or realize. And it's going to take a heart conversion to be accomplished by the Holy Spirit in God's people or we will be lost eternally. The Sabbath hours are wholly sacred, and we need to keep our mind stayed on God. Amen. It's our spiritual health of the greatest necessity. How does our minds and mouths and feet tread on God's holy time? We need to ask ourselves, ask God to show us. If it means turning off every computer, every mobile device, then turn it off. And you don't turn the computer on. If, if this church service is the only way you can have a church service, then just turn it on just before it's time to come on. And shut it off when we're, all, when we're done. Amen. We need to guard our minds with such diligence and vigilance. Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves speaking the words of the mind of the world, speaking and thinking the, the things of this world. And not having our mind stayed on Christ. Finding our own pleasure. It doesn't matter what that pleasure is. But we rob God of his time. Pleasure, the Hebrew word. Pleasure, hence, desire. Concretely, a valuable thing, hence a matter as something in the mind. Pleasure by desire, by value, and by thought. Which it also is with motive. When we work on the Sabbath hours, here it is condemned. 
for there is value gained. And those who work on the Sabbath, it's not in, not in this sermon. I'm just going to let you know. Those who work on the Sabbath of a necessity of an emergency situation, 100% of it is considered tithe. Amen. <clears throat> because it's God's time. Number six, speaking our own words. It was in studying this subject this week that blew me away because there's things in this section that I believe we need to study individually and collectively to understand thoroughly what it means to speak our own words. Prophet of God, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 702 and 703. When the Sabbath commences, we should place on guard upon a guard upon ourselves and upon our acts and our words. Lest we rob him by appropriating to our own use that time which is what? Strictly the Lord's. We should not do ourselves nor suffer our children to do any manner of our own work for a what? Livelihood. Livelihood. Or anything which could have been done what? On the six working days. Now, this next two sentences is where I think we should have family conversation literally around the world as Seventh-day Adventist. Here's what she says. Friday is the day of preparation. Amen. But notice the next sentence of what we are to be preparing. Time then, time can then be devoted to making the necessity, necessary preparation for the Sabbath and to thinking and conversing about it. Amen. In other words, not food preparation, not cleaning the house preparation, but preparation of our minds so that we are thinking about what we are going to be talking about, what we are going to be conversing about on the Sabbath hours. That is what is more important. Now, if you think you need food, maybe we should be doing it on Thursday if we don't have enough time on Friday to get our minds and our ideas transformed to be constantly and thoughtfully and prayerfully cons conversing of God's will in our lives on his Sabbath hours. Consider this, God's view, the sixth day of the week. Its purpose and design is a full day of preparation, planning concerning the thoughts and conversations we are going to have with others. In other words, You know, God has given us the technology of being able to put food in the refrigerator and food in the freezer. And when we prepare our food, we need to make sure that it is simple and not a gourmet meal.
And if we live our lives appropriately, the house will not need all the cleaning that it needs to be done on Friday. We should be able to clean the house on Thursday and do a light cleaning, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes on, on Friday. If we are living our lives as God has wanted us to live it, then maybe we would have our lives ordered to the point where we would be able to enter into God's rest and actually enjoy it. the Holy Sabbath and call it a delight because we have lived in the expectation of it. We have been praying that as we enter into the house that God will give us the fresh hot bread from his throne. Not stale food. Spiritually. She continues. Nothing which will in the sight of heaven be regarded as a violation of the Holy Sabbath should be left unsaid or undone is to be said or done upon the Sabbath. God requires not only that we refrain from physical labor on the Sabbath, but that the mind be disciplined to dwell upon sacred themes. Mind discipline. Boy, do we need that. The topic of great importance is if we would, our minds are so encumbered with the world that even on the Sabbath, we got the world in our minds and we speak it. And just try to twist the conversation to make it think that it's appropriate. If our thoughts are throughout the week of this world, if we're lacking family worship morning and evening, if we cannot meditate on Jesus any time of the day, then maybe we need a reorganization of what we're doing. How can we really prepare for God's Holy Sabbath and expect our minds to keep it if our minds are so encumbered by this world? We need to keep our phones down. And keep our minds on God. The fourth commandment is virtually transgressed by conversing upon worldly things or by engaging in light, trifling conversation. Talking upon anything and everything which may come into the mind is speaking our own words. And she ends by this sentence every deviation from right brings us into what bondage and, bondage and condemnation every deviation whether by our careless speaking or by the mouths of others we are in company with on God's holy day. Every deviation. It is eternally important that we are careful of who we associate with on the Sabbath hours. Every deviation. It would be better if we spent the Sabbath strictly alone and without family interference if they, the family, will bring a deviation from what God has expected. Every deviation brings bondage and condemnation. And without repentance, and reformation 
it will result in eternal death. So we close with verse 14. Then, we call the Sabbath of delight, and we keep it holy. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And the Lord says, I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and to feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The final thoughts. Is heaven so desired that throughout the week our primary thought is heavenward? Does our lips, when used, point to here to heaven's principles and power? God has declared it. His people will ride on the high places. Not in self-exaltation, but in power and glory for God in the humble, contrite spirit that he has designed. Where is our mind stayed? Is it stayed on heaven's things? Let this mind be in you that was, it was in Jesus when he walked on this earth as a man. The dusty wayside roads of Galilee with his mind stayed on his heavenly father. Our Father, which art in heaven. We need the purifying wine of present truth to root out the sin and its nature. God has promised deliverance from all sin. Father, we need your light within. Shine your glory from within. Shine in us this day. We pray. Amen. 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 Let us sing for a closing hymn, Lord, I'm coming home. Are we going to come home to the pure life? Desiring to be all the way his and his alone. Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh.
to be drunk with the wine of this world. What a terrible travesty <clears throat> to live a life, profession, and no victory and lose out an eternal life just for the philosophies of this world in a convenient profession of faith. God forbid. Let us be holy gods in all things. Let us kneel before his throne. Loving, merciful Father. It is during this time of probation that you've given us the opportunity to understand what you expect of us. Lord, you said it's a narrow way that leads to heaven. Because this world is so entangled in every aspect of life. That we need your Holy Spirit to tell us exactly what to do. To leave off those things 
which encumber, encumber us in this world. And devote ourselves strictly to thee. For it is only then that we will have a life that is wholly thine. So cleanse us from any unrighteousness in our life. Wash us clean with the blood of your son. Empower us with his life that we may have the mind of Jesus and not the mind of this world. Lord, help us never to be thinking ourselves better than we are. Let us continually be praying for our brothers and sisters who are professing Christianity, but that are so far away from what you want. Give us words to say, things that we can do to bring your love into their lives. They will desire your truth above everything else. So magnify thyself and us we pray. And keep our minds humble before thee. To be your servants. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close. I pray that something said today by your by God's Spirit will strengthen us to be a lighthouse in this dark world. The evil is intensifying and it's going to get much worse. And we need the Spirit of God every moment of every day. So go from his house and be a blessing. Blessed Sabbath. Amen. Amen.